am Professor Patrick. Professor. Doctor Professor Patrick. So welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about pediatrics. And once again, this is going to be a case-based review series. A lot of this material is targeted toward the pediatric shelf and the pediatrics portions of the Step 2 CK Comlex and Pants exams. So we're going to jump right into things with congenital and metabolic diseases. We'll follow that up with immunology and infectious diseases in pediatrics. And then we'll finish things out with cardiology and pulmonology for part one. So starting out with congenital and metabolic diseases, the learning objectives here are to articulate the common causes of intellectual disability, to appraise physical signs and symptoms of congenital chromosomal syndromes, to recognize and contrast the presentation of metabolic enzyme deficiencies, and to classify common presentations of glycogen storage diseases and lysosomal storage diseases. So starting out with intellectual disability, we've got a case of a six-year-old boy who presents to the pediatrician for screening of ADHD. He's been falling behind in school, and he has consistent outbursts in classes that have earned him some reprimanding. On exam, there's macrocephaly, macroorchidism, and a large jaw. So that's the typical phenotypic characteristics of fragile X syndrome. It's the most common inherited mental retardation due to a trinucleotide repeat of CGG on chromosome X. It's more common in boys than girls, so you want to look for that in a case vignette. Next up, we've got a six-year-old girl who presents to the pediatrician for screening of ADHD. She's been falling behind in school and consistent outbursts in classes earned her reprimanding as well. On exam, there is a smooth philantrum and a head circumference in the seventh percentile. So a bit of microcephaly and this classic smooth philantrum or um, eyes that are closer together is phenotypic for fetal alcohol syndrome. This is the most common cause of mental retardation in the United States, um, inherited or not. And this one is, of course, acquired. That's why the um, Association of Pediatric Physicians recommend that um, no pregnant woman consume alcohol. Um, in Europe, they recommend less than one drink per day. Um, but a lot of the times this is difficult considering most of the uh, neural tube is formed before most women know that they're pregnant. Um, so preconception counseling is very important. Now we've got a case of Down syndrome. So a 39-year-old G5P1131 mother presents to labor and delivery. She's had a routine prenatal screening and denied any anatomic or enzymatic screening. After delivery, the newborn has hypotonia, oblique palpable fissures, and a simian crease, as well as macroglossia. So this is a phenotypic characteristics of Down syndrome. And then this woman is at risk considering she's um, older for her gestational age, so 39 years old. Um, anybody above 35 is considered advanced gestational age. So the next best step here to confirm would be a karyotype, or um, if this is sort of a familial inheritance, you want to look at a Robertsonium translocation. Um, you can screen for Down syndrome. You can use the quad screen performed between 9 and 12 weeks, um, which involve a um, ultrasound as well as um, different enzymatic um, levels. You can also do fetal DNA now at 10 weeks. Um, you can tell the sex of the child as well as their risk of down syndrome. Um, there are screening, um, say this was positive, the next step would be an amniocentesis or a CVS. You cannot perform these um, until later on in gestation. So you can't perform an amniocentesis until 16 weeks and it increases your miscarriage rate by 0.5%. And then CVS, you cannot perform until after 11 weeks, but it increases the miscarriage rate by 1%. So some common medical complications of Down syndrome. VSDs are still the most common type of congenital cardiac anomaly in Down syndrome, um, but there's a very highly increased risk of endocardial Cushing's defect. Um, there's an increased risk of Hirschsprung's disease, intestinal atresias, imperforate anus, annular pancreas, hypothyroidism, atlantoaxial instability, and the increased risk of ALL after the age of 5 and Alzheimer's disease due to the extra chromosome 21. So some other congenital chromosomal syndromes. We've got a mother without prenatal care presenting to labor and delivery with contractions at three minute intervals. She rapidly progresses and delivers in the triage area. On exam, the child has an omphalocele, rocker bottom feet, hammer toes, microcephaly, and clenched hands. So this is diagnostic of Edwards syndrome or trisomy 18. 
Um, say there was holoprosencephaly with severe mental retardation, microcephaly, and a cleft lip. Um, this would be more indicative of Patau syndrome or trisomy 13. Next, we've got a case of a 16-year-old girl who presents to the pediatrician for delayed puberty. She's the shortest girl in her school, and she has not had menarche. On exam, there's a webbed neck and Turner stage 1 breast with a wide-spaced areola. So this is phenotypic of Turner syndrome, which is XO. Um, it's associated with horseshoe kidneys, string ovaries, um, and um, inability to conceive. Um, coarctation of the aorta, bicuspid aortic valve. And the treatment here is estrogen therapy um, for secondary sex characteristics and prevention of osteoporosis. Next, we've got a 16-year-old boy presents for um, breast development. He's one of the tallest boys in his school, and he attends special education classes. On exam, there's gynecomastia and hypogonadism. So this is typical of Klinefelter syndrome, or XXY syndrome. It's associated with an increased risk of gonadal malignancies, so there's increased screening. Next, um, we'll start to go through some of these, um, like Angelman syndrome, um, Angelman syndrome. It's an increased risk of seizures, strabismus. Um, the childs appear sociable with episodic laughter, and there's a deletion in the maternal chromosome 15. Um, the paternal chromosomal um, arrangement here is silenced. And then compare that with prader willi syndrome, which is hypotonia, hypogonadism, hyperphagia with skin picking and aggression. And this is a deletion on the paternal chromosome 15, and then the maternal chromosome is silenced. Um, next, we've got Williams syndrome, um, which is commonly an elf in appearance, very friendly, increased empathy and verbal reasoning ability. And this is a deletion on chromosome 7. I tend to think of this like Will Ferrell um, in elf. Um, next, we've got corneal, Cornelia Delange syndrome, which presents with intrauterine growth restriction, hypertonia, distinctive facies, lung malformations, and self-injurious behaviors. Next, we've got Wardenberg syndrome, which is commonly predicted with advanced paternal age. There are short palpable fissures, a white forelock, and deafness. Next, there is smith majury syndrome, where there is a broad square face with short stature and self-injurious behavior, and this is a deletion on chromosome 17. And then last, there's Pierre Robin syndrome, which is mandibular hypoplasia, glossopteris, and cleft soft palate. Moving into the enzymatic metabolism deficiencies, we've got a case of an 18-year-old from central Pennsylvania who presents for developmental delay and seizures. He's never seen a physician before. He comes from a conservative Amish community. On exam, the boy has fair hair, blue eyes, pale skin, and a musty odor. So this is classic of PKU, or phenylketonuria. It's an autosomal recessive defect in phenylalanine hydroxylase, and it's diagnosed on a universal newborn screening, and they do tandem mass spec or quantitative amino acid analysis to determine that. And you can treat this with a low phenylalanine diet. Um, it has risks of mental retardation um, if you're not able to screen for this acutely and screen out as much phenylalanine as possible in the diet. Next, there's a case of a two-week-old who presents for a weight check after birth. The child appears listless, and their urine and earwax smells like maple syrup. So this is maple syrup urine disorder or disease. It's an autosomal recessive defect in branch chain amino acid metabolism, and you can diagnose this with serum amino acids. There'll be higher rates of the branch chain amino acids. Next case is a one-week-old newborn being examined in the NICU. She's treated for severe jaundice and hepatomegaly. Vital signs show a temperature of 36 degrees. On exam, there's bilateral cataracts. So this is more typical of glucosemia, or galactosemia, sorry. It's an autosomal, rec autosomal recessive defect in galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. There's a risk of neonatal E. coli sepsis with galactosemia. And some other sugar metabolism deficiencies that are often compared to this. Aldose B deficiency is commonly a four to six month old with vomiting, poor feeding, and lethargy. Somebody with uridyl diphosphatase galactose 4 deficiency would be, it's similar to galactosemia with hypotonia and deafness as well. And then galactokinase deficiency um, just presents with the bilateral cataracts. Um, so those are the common sugar disorders to look for. Next is a case of a 12 year old who presents to the ED with sudden onset hemiplegia and speech abnormalities. Vital signs show normotensive with a normal heart rate and rhythm. 
On exam, there's a pectus deformity and arachidactyly and joint hypermobility. And this is homocystinuria. They've got a marfanoid typical habitus, um, which is seen in the vignette, and then they are hypercoagulable. So this um, child prevented with a CVA or stroke. It's an autosomal recessive defect in cytosine synthase, leading to elevated homocysteine and methionine levels, and the risk of thrombotic effects increase. So you have to, you have to treat this with vitamin B6, folate B12, and then anticoagulation. Going to the glycogen storage diseases, a three-month-old presents following a seizure. On exam, there's a doll-like face with thin extremities and a protuberant abdomen with hepatomegaly. Labs show normal LFTs and an elevated lactate and uric acid. This is von Gierke's disease, or glycogen storage type 1. It's a deficiency in glucose 6-phosphatase in the liver and kidneys, and it can cause hypoglycemia, lactic acidosis, hypertriglyceridemia, and hyperuricemia. Next, we've got a case of a one-week-old who presents to the ED for failure to feed. On exam, there's a floppy baby with macroglossia and a displaced PMI. This is diagnostic of Pompe's disease. It's a deficiency in acid maltase, or alpha-1,6 glucodase, which causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and hepatomegaly and early death. Um, the common mnemonic for this is Pompe's trashes the pump, um, so look for heart failure with a glycogen storage disease differential. Next, there's a four-month-old who presents for increasing abdominal size and growth retardation. On exam, there's thin extremities and a protuberant abdomen with hepatomegaly. Labs show elevated LFTs with a normal lactate and uric acid. So the labs are different than von Gierke's disease, and this is Cori's disease. It's a deficiency in glycogen debranching enzyme, or alpha-1,6-glucosidase. It's very similar to von Gierke's, but you want to look for elevated LFTs and a normal lactate and uric acid. And last, we've got type 5, or a 6-year-old girl who presents with exercise intolerance. She's unable to keep up with the soccer team because she has painful muscle cramps and experiences dark urine. So this is McArdle's disease. It's a deficiency in muscle myophosphorylase, and this leads to impaired glycogen breakdown. You can treat this with oral sucrose before exercise. Going into the lysosomal storage diseases, We've got a case of a nine-month-old who's an Ashkenazi Jewish family, presents with loss of motor milestones, feeding difficulties, and hypotonia. On exam, there is a cherry red macula. So the differential here would be Tay-Sachs disease or Neiman's Pick disease. Tay-Sachs is an X-linked recessive disease in hexomenidase A, which causes a buildup in GM2 ganglioside. And then Neiman Pick's disease is autosomal recessive disease in sphingomyelinase, which causes hepatosplenomegaly and aeroflexia. So the difference here on physical exam would be Neiman Pick's disease is going to cause elevated hepatosplenomegaly, and Tay-Sachs disease you might not be able to appreciate the hepatosplenomegaly. Next, we've got a case of a seven-year-old boy who presents to the pediatrician for fatigue, dyspnea, recurrent painful episodes and ex extremities in GI tract. On exam, there's peripheral neuropathy and numerous papules on the trunk and upper thigh. So this is Fabry's disease. It's an X-linked recessive defect in alpha-galactosidase, causing ceramide trihexoside to accumulate. Next, we've got a case of a 12-year-old girl from a Jewish community who presents to the pediatrician with painful hips. She's been followed, by, or followed for anemia and thrombocytopenia since birth. On exam, there are yellow-brown discolorations on the sclera, and x-rays show visible aseptic necrosis of the femur head and signs of osteoporosis, and this would be Gaucher's disease. It's an autosomal recessive defect in glucocerebrosidase, and you can treat this with a recombinant glucocerebrosidase. Last, we've got a case of a two-year-old who presents with um, developmental regression, hypotonia, areflexia, peripheral neuropathy. On exam, there's no hepatosplenomegaly or cherry red macula, so this is Crabbe disease. It's an autosomal recessive defect in galactocerebrosidase. So this is similar to Tay-Sachs and Neiman Picks, but there is no cherry red macula. Continuing on, we've got an 18-month-old who presents with difficulty walking and an abnormal gait and vision loss. On exam, there's muscle wasting with rigidity and nystagmus, and this is metachromatic leukodystrophy. It's an autosomal recessive defect in aryl sulfatase, leading to cerebrosidase sulfate accumulation. Next, we've got a case of a 15-year-old boy who presents with behavioral changes and decreased school performance. On exam, there's neuropathy, hyperpigmentation, and paraparesis. Labs show hyperkalemia and hyponatremia, and this is adrenal leukodystrophy. 
So it's an X-linked recessive defect in ABCD1, which causes a buildup of fatty acids in the myelin sheath. Um, so it's similar to metachromatic leukodystrophy, but you want to look for some sort of adrenal deficiency, so the hyperkalemia and hyponatremia here. Next, we've got a two-year-old boy who presents with um, seeing difficulties and an enlarging abdomen. Since birth, his parents have noted his facial features have gotten progressively more coarse. And on exam, there is corneal clouding and hepatosplenomegaly. So this is Hurler syndrome, um, which is an alpha l iodinase deficiency, causing a buildup of heparin sulfate and dermata sulfate. Um, this is similar to Hunter syndrome, where Hunter's is an X-linked recessive defect, and there is no corneal clouding in Hunter syndrome. Going into the immunology and infectious disease categories here, your learning objectives are to identify the causes of torches infections, to characterize and manage selective pediatric exanthema, and to evaluate and treat patients following animal bites and differentiate pediatric auto, auto immu or immunodeficiencies. So some of the torches infections here, we've got a case of a newborn following birth into the ED with seizures. The child was born at home to full term to a G1 mom without any prenatal care. She volunteers at the Humane Society and currently houses many animals. On exam, the child has microcephaly, micronaphthia, and a purpuric violaceous rash on the abdomen, or blueberry muffin rash. CT scan shows intracranial calcifications, and this is diagnostic for congenital toxoplasmosis. So this is um, at risk for pregnant women who work with um, cat litter or cat feces and you can treat this with sulfadalazine or leukocorvin. Next, we've got a case of a newborn being evaluated in a refugee camp in Ukraine. The child presents with a purple spotty rash and cataracts. On exam, there's continuous machine-like murmur. Um, we'll learn later in the cardiac section that that is pathognomonic for a PDA, and this is congenital rubella syndrome. You can prevent this with MMR vaccine before pregnancy. This is a live vaccine, so it can't be given during pregnancy. Um, a lot of the times mothers won't know that they are infected with rubella. Um, it can present as a common URI or cold. Next case, we've got a newborn with microcephaly and petechial rash after birth. His mother had a routine prenatal care but recalls having a flu-like illness. The child fails newborn hearing screening and CT confirms the results. So this is congenital CMV. It presents similar to toxoplasmosis with the addition of deafness and you could have treated this with gancyclovir. Next, there's a newborn seen on day of life two for newborn exam. She has congestion and clear rhinorrhea. On exam, there's a rash on the palms and soles as well as anterior bowing of the uh, tibia. So this is congenital syphilis or snuffles disease. Um, you can treat this with penicillin and try to prevent the further abnormalities, oftentimes in the bones. Next case, we've got a three day old who presents to the ED with seizures. He was born at home to a woman with limited prenatal care and seemed healthy until this morning. He had developed fever and rash on his face. Lumbar puncture results show blood and elevated white count, and CT exam shows bilateral temporal hemorrhage, and this is diagnostic for congenital HSV and HSV encephalitis, and you would want to treat this with acyclovir. So lastly, we've got a newborn seized from a religious cult and is found to have limb hypoplasia, cutaneous scars, and cataracts and this is diagnostic for congenital varicella. So some common pediatric exanthemas. We've got a one-year-old from California who presents with a cough, runny nose, and high fever. His father does not approve of Western medicine, but his mother believes something is wrong. On exam, there are gray spots on the buccal mucosa and a macular rash on the posterior auricular area and trunk, and those are common signs of measles or rubeola. It's diagnosed with serologies, and treatment is supportive care um, and a trial of vitamin A. Some of the precautions here, it's extremely contagious, and it can spread by respiratory droplets that remain in the air for hours. Any suspected patients must be taken into a private entrance and placed in a negative pressure room while wearing N95 face masks. Next case, beginning in the first grade, his parents noticed a change in behavior with depression and odd fevers. After a few months, he begins to have myoclonic jerks and ataxia. The diagnosis is confirmed with EEG and MRI showing cortical white matter atrophy, and he passes away shortly thereafter. So this child, um, who had the measles infections very young, um, was at risk of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, or SSPE, and you can prevent this with the MMR vaccine. 
um, because SSPE is a 100% um, fatal um, infection and it's an increased risk um, compared to one in 600 people who get measles between two and five. Anyone one or younger, it's uh, one in 60. So it's a 100 times increase for young children who get measles. There's also a risk of ADAM or acute De acute disseminated encephalomyelitis um, from measles infection as well. Next up, we've got a two-year-old who presents with fever and rash. For the previous four days, the infant has had a fever to 39 degrees, and just this morning when the fever broke, a rash surfaced. So the rash is lacy, pink, macular, and it's mostly on the trunk. So this is roseola, um, or HSV6. It can cause very high fevers, um, usually about four days of fevers. And then when the fever breaks, the rash surfaces. And this is a common predictor or a precipitate of febrile seizures. Next, we've got a three-year-old who presents with fever and rash. She's been fussy with a low-grade fever and has had decreased feeds for the past few days. On exam, there is conjunctivitis, tender lymphadenopathy, and pinpoint macular rash that began on the head and trunk that blanches. So this is classic for rubella syndrome. There are um, some post-infectious encephalopathy that develops when we within weeks of this um, infection, and adolescents and adults can develop arthralgias for months if they can or if they contract rubella. Next, we've got a case of an unvaccinated 18-year-old daycare worker from California who presents with fever, malaise, and parotid swelling. So this is mumps. It's associated with a loss of fertility, especially in teens to older men who get this. And you can prevent this with the MMR vaccine as well. Next up, we've got a five-year-old who presents with a few days of fussiness and low-grade fever. On exam, there's a reticular rash on the cheeks that extends to the trunk. And he has a sibling with sickle cell disease. So this is parvovirus B19 or erythema infectiosum. It's dangerous to those with sickle cell disease or thalassemia because of the risk of aplastic crisis. It's also dangerous for pregnant mothers due to the risk of high drops fetalis. Moving on, we've got a case here of a five-year-old seen in the urgent care for an animal bite. His mother states she found him trying to pet a dead possum. When she shrieked, it awoke and bit his hand. She cleaned the wound with soap and water for 10 minutes before coming in, which is the first step. On exam, there are two puncture wounds on the left hand with minimal erythema or bleeding. The next best steps here would be to start rabies immunoglobulin, part of it flushed in the wound, and then the other part injected, and then the rabies vaccine series. If this is a domesticated animal, there's an option to quarantine the animal and to test the animal for rabies um, before starting this series. The most common animals are skunks, bats, raccoons, foxes, and dogs. Um, in the developing world, dogs is the most common animal. In the United States, skunks is actually the most common animal. And then a special case for bats, um, because their um, bites are a lot less noticeable. Anyone found um, with a bat in the room, so to speak, um, should be treated for rabies as a precaution. So some signs of infection includes hydro or hydrophobia, aerophobia, and pharyngeal spasms, which cause the um, foaming of the mouth because you don't want to drink any water or swallow your sputum. Um, and eventually develops into coma, respiratory failure, and death if it's not treated early with the passive and active immunity. Going into immunodeficiencies, we've got a case of a 17-year-old with recurrent URIs and UTIs. Three months ago, she contracted measles, although she had been fully vaccinated. And laboratory exams showed low levels of all IgGs, but normal B cells. And this is common variable immunodeficiency. And this increases your risk of lymphoma. Um, this presents usually in the teens to young adult period um, with common infections and infections where they had previously been immune. Next up, we've got a 13-year-old girl with a history of GI symptoms and recurrent pneumonias presenting for fever and cough. She started a gluten-free diet and many of her symptoms are improving. However, she still has stomach flus and colds and more often than the rest of the um, children at school. So this would be selective IgA deficiency. It's associated with celiac disease. And then a precaution here is to watch for anaphylaxis with transfusions. Next case, we've got a nine-month-old boy who presents for recurrent pneumonias and diarrheal illnesses. On exam, there's no tonsils seen, and flow cytometry shows absent B cells with a low level of all IgGs. So this would be Bruton's agammaglobinemia, which is an X-linked recessive loss of tyrosine kinase 
um, which presents six to nine months, um, usually due to the protection of maternal antibodies. And you want to treat this with monthly IVIG. Next, we've got the case of a one-year-old who's seen for failure to thrive. He had been eating well and the parents are compliant with nutrition consults, but the child has been in and out of the urgent care for recurrent sinopulmonary infections. On review of the cultures, there are multiple strep pneumo, H flu, and PCP pneumonia have been cultured. So this is hyper IgM syndrome. It's an X-linked recessive defect in CD40 ligand, which can't bind to the CD40 on B cells and produce class switching. And you want to treat this with antibiotics and IVIG. Next, we've got a case of a two-year-old presenting for recurrent ear infections. He has a history of bleeding after circumcision and treatment for eczema. On exam, there is petechial rash. So this is wiscott aldridge syndrome. There are low levels of IgM and IgG, but there's elevated IgE. So think of this as eczema, thrombocytopenia, and bleeding, um, and immunodeficiencies. Next, we've got a one-year-old who's presenting to the PICU with severe pneumonia and UTI. He's been in and out of the NICU since birth with strange infections and unrelenting diarrhea. Lab studies show lymphopenia. So this is SCID, or severe combined immunodeficiency. It's most commonly X-linked recessive, but there are autosomal and aus autosomal recessive and dominant inherited. Um, it includes, it is included in neonatal screening now, and the treatment is IVIG um, until a cure with bone marrow transplant. Next, we've got a one week old who's seen in the NICU for sepsis. After birth, she suffered a seizure, which delayed diagnosis of a congenital heart murmur. On exam, there's a small mouth and absent thyroid. So this is DeGeorge syndrome. It's a defect in the fourth pharyngeal arch causing the lack of a thymus. Um, it also lacks the parathyroid glands which cause the hypocalcemia and seizures and tetany. You can diagnose this with a fish um, looking for microdeletion in chromosome 22.11. Next we've got a case of a two-year-old presenting to the dermatologist for recurrent skin abscesses. Over the past year and a half he has had countless abscesses drained and also recurrent pneumonias. Gram stain shows phagocytes with gram positive organisms inside and then the nitro blue tetrazalamine test is positive. So this is a chronic granulomatous disease. It's an X-linked recessive defect in NADPH oxidase um, enzyme complex and this leads to an inability to form hydrogen peroxide and impaired intracellular killing within phagocytes. The treatment is prophylaxis with TMPSMX and itraconazole um, to stop any grant or catalase producing organisms. Next we've got a two-year-old boy who presents with recurrent skin infections and periodontitis. There's a lack of pus formation and poor wound healing following infections. His parents remarked that there was a delayed cord separation which is a classic symptom of this. Labs show neutrophilia with greater than 40,000 WBCs. So this is leukocyte adhesion deficiency. It's caused by a defective integrins on the leukocyte surface. So although he's able to respond to infections, the white blood cells cannot remove themselves or extravasate from the um, lumen of vessels. So they're unable to get to the site of infections. So there leads to increased amount of white blood cells within um, the vasculature. Next, we've got a four-year-old who's presenting with recurrent skin abscesses. Over the past three years, he's had countless drained and he's cultured staph aureus. On exam, there are areas of um, hypopigmented areas of skin, and this is Chetty-Higashi syndrome. It's due to an autosomal recessive defect in lysosomal tract thickening proteins, and it causes defects in phagocytosis. It can progress to lymphoma in an accelerated phase. Um, last, we've got a case of a 16-year-old who presents with recurrent facial swelling and colicky abdominal pain. The swelling is not related to foods, medicines, or exposures. And on exam, there's no urticaria. Labs show C1Q levels are normal and C4 is decreased. And this is hereditary angioedema. There's defects in C1 esterase, which lead to increasing levels of C2B and bradykinin, which causes this um, almost allergic-like reaction. Moving into cardiology, the learning objectives here are to characterize and manage benign heart murmurs to evaluate cyanotic and non-cyanotic heart lesions and recognize the associations between them, um, to classify and treat rheumatic heart disease, to diagnose and treat cardiac infections, and to evaluate cardiac abnormalities via chest radiographs.
So starting out with benign murmurs, we've got a case of a two-year-old seen at a well child check. He's developing normally with good feeding and elimination. Growth chart is at appropriate. And cardiac exam reveals a two out of six vibratory systolic murmur in the third intercostal space in the left sternal border. And this is a stills murmur. Any systolic murmur that is two out of six or less um, is most likely benign. Um, next case, we've got a five-year-old girl seen for a viral URI. A second-year medical student exclaims that there's an extra heart sound, and it's heard just after S2. And there's a two out of six um, sound heard in the anterior neck. And this is an S3 and venous hum. Both of these are normal within children um, or extremely conditioned athletes. So any diastolic murmur or murmur greater than two out of six needs to be evaluated with an echo in pediatrics. So for some non-cyanotic heart lesions, we've got a case of a nine-month-old child who's not as active as the other children. During the past months, he's had multiple episodes of respiratory difficulty following feeding. And on physical exam, a loud holosystolic murmur is audible at the left lower sternal border. And there are diffuse crackles over the lungs bilaterally with dullness percussion at the base. And this is a VSD. It's the most common cardiac anomaly and it's medically managed with diuretics and ACE inhibitors until about six months to one year when it can be surgically corrected. And you wanna watch for pulmonary hypertension or widening of the QRS, as these are both worrisome signs. So not all VSDs can present at birth. Um, wider VSDs actually have a smaller murmur, and um, the murmur is usually absent if the pressures are equal between the two chambers. Um, it's difficult to hear. Next, we've got a case of a newborn with difficulty breathing after birth, and he's taken to the NICU for resuscitation. Mom has a history of bipolar disorder and did not receive any prenatal care. On exam, there's a triple gallop heard with a systolic murmur that's worse on inspiration, so more on the right side of the heart. Uh, chest x-ray shows cardiomegaly. Diagnosis here would be Epstein's anomaly. It's a malformed tricuspid valve in the right ventricle, usually due to a toxic effect of lithium. It's associated with Wolf-Parkinson-White disease, and you can treat this with medical management of the CHF until surgery is provided at about six months to one year. Last, we've got an 18-year-old Army recruit complaining of pain in his legs when he runs. On exam, his pulse is 76, and BP is 165 over 90. His radial pulses are plus 4, and his dorsalis pedis pulse is plus 1. This is a coarctation of the aorta. It's associated with Turner syndrome, face syndrome, and bicuspid aortic valves. And x-ray findings that you can look for are the three sign and rib notching. You can treat this with stenting or angioplasty. Now we've got a newborn who's being evaluated in the ED who was born at home six hours ago. His mother states she does not want any vaccines be provided because everyone in her cult is unvaccinated. The child presents with rash and cataracts and on exam there's a continuous machine-like murmur. So that's a pathognomonic for a patent ductus arteriosus. It's associated with prematurity congenital rubella syndrome and char syndrome, and you can treat uh, small lesions with endomethacin. They should close after about one week at life, especially in your preemies. And PDA-dependent lesions, or lesions that need the PDA open, are coarctation of the aorta, a D-type transposition of the great arteries, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, um, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, and tricuspid atresia. And all of these, you would wanna keep the PDA open, and you treat this with prostaglandin E1, or PGE1 to keep it open. Next, we've got a 17-year-old basketball athlete seen in clinic following a syncopal episode. She had previously felt lightheaded, but attributed this to poor conditioning, and her family history is relevant for her father passing away at 34 due to a drowning. On exam, there's a three out of six systolic ejection murmur that's auscultated that increases with Valsalva and decreases with squatting and hand grip. So those are opposite of what normally happens um, with cardiac murmurs and that's because this cardiac murmur is increased with a decreased preload. So the less amount of blood that causes the heart to open up, the larger this obstruction is going to be. So this is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCAM. It's an autosomal dominant beta-2 macroglobulin mutation, and you can treat this with beta blockers. Um, extreme patients may need an ICD or ethanol ablation if that's unsuccessful. Next, we've got a five-year-old developing normally that has a well child check. He's difficult to keeping up with his teammates on the soccer team. On physical exam, there is a systolic murmur best heard at the left upper border with an associated fixed split S2. So a fixed splitting of the S2 is pathognomonic for ASD or atrial septal defect. 
and there there is a risk of Eisenmenger syndrome or reversal of the shunt um, if the um, pulmonic circuit develops pulmonary hypertension and develops higher pressures than the systemic circuit. Next up, we've got a one-month-old with Down syndrome who presents for evaluation. During feedings, her mom notices the child gets sweaty, and on exam, there's a thick split of S2 with a systolic ejection murmur, and there's a high risk of endocardial um, Cushing's defect or atrioventricular defect in Down syndrome patients. There's a risk of Eisenmenger syndrome, and you want to treat this with surgical correction before one year to prevent pulmonary hypertension. Last, we've got a 17-year-old who's found to be cyanotic and in distress. She was known to have a congenital heart murmur. So this is Eisenmenger syndrome. That's going to be the reversal of the shunt from a left to right to right to left, or a cyanotic shunt. And this is due to elevation of the pulmonary pressures greater than the systemic pressures. Moving into the cyanotic heart lesions, We've got an infant born at term who's cyanotic during the first month of life. Her mother describes instances where she's crying and agitated, and then she turns blue. Um, the child's cyanosis resolves when she squats. Examination um, shows a harsh systolic murmur, and the diagnosis here with tetralogy of Fallot. It's the most common cyanotic heart lesion, and it's associated with Down syndrome. The severity is determined by the pulmonary stenosis here. It also has a right atrial deviation and a boot-shaped heart on x-ray. And you want to treat these TET spells with knee to chest, oxygen, fluids, and morphine. The definitive treatment is surgical repair at about six months. Next, we've got a case of a G1 mom who delivers a newborn at 41 weeks. Apgars are 6 and 6 with persistent cyanosis. And on exam, there's a holosystolic murmur. EKG shows a left atrial deviation at absent R waves in the precordial lead. And this is tricuspid atresia. Um, it's associated with ASD, PDA, and VSD um, in order for survival. And this is fatal without proper surgical repair. Next, there's an infant seen at a refugee clinic with fa failure to gain weight, seizures, and recurrent infections. On exam, there's a small jaw and cyanosis when agitated. Cardiac auscultation shows a single S2 with a systolic ejection murmur. And point of care ionized calcium is 4.5. So this sounds like a case of DeGeorge syndrome um, and truncus arteriosus. It's commonly associated with DeGeorge. And chest x-ray might show the absence of a thymus and increased pulmonary vascular markings and cardiomegaly. This is going to be treated with surgical repair. Next, there's a G4P3 diabetic mother who gives birth to a cyanotic newborn. There's no improvement with oxygen. And NICU arrives to transport the child. On exam, there's a holosystolic murmur with a single S2, and this is transposition of the great arteries. It's most commonly associated, it's the most common neonatal cyanotic lesion, so the most common one that will present at birth. And a PDA, ASD, or VSD is needed for survival. The classic x-ray sign is egg on a string, and we'll see that later. And treatment with prostaglandins or emergency septostomy to allow blood mixing is needed. And then last, there's total anomalous pulmonary venous return and the buzzword to know here is snowman sign on chest x-ray. Going into rheumatic fever, we've got so we've got a five-year-old with joint pains, nodules on her legs. Her mother explains that she had a sore throat two weeks ago while on a family vacation and she's never had treatment. On exam, she's febrile and there is swelling and tenderness at the hands, knees, and ankles with associated small subcutaneous nodules. Labs show an elevated streptolysin O titer and this is rheumatic fever. She's got many of the Jones criteria or joint pain. O is for heart murmur. N is for subcutaneous nodules. E is for erythema marginatum. And S is Sydenham chorea. It's often two to four weeks following a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection. And you need two of these major criteria or one major and two minor um, to diagnose it. You can treat it with long-acting IM benzaprine penicillin G until adulthood to eradicate any bacterial carriage and prevent any recurrent um, rheumatic fever and worsening rheumatic heart disease. The Sinanham Korea can be treated with steroids. Next, we've got a 14-year-old immigrant from Sub-Saharan Africa presenting for decreased exercise tolerance. She's had a history of repeated infections with joint pain, rashes, and swaying movements. On exam, there's a systolic snap followed by a four out of six rumbling diastolic murmur in the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular that radiates to the axilla. 
So this is mitral stenosis. It's caused by rheumatic heart disease, and it leads to pulmonary hypertension, left atrial enlargement, and AFib. The treatment here is going to be beta blockers and diuretics or balloon, balloon valvuloplasty. Some cardiac infections. We've got a three-year-old with a history of tetralogy of flow who's feverish four weeks after his first dental cleaning. He's also had strange marks on his hands and fingernails. On exam, he's febrile, and there's a two out of six murmur. Diagnosis here would be infective endocarditis, and you want to do the Duke's criteria. Most common cause would be a strep viridans and pterococcus, or the Haysac organisms, Haemophilus actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Echinochella, and Kingella. And you want to prophylax these with penicillins or cephalosporins. Think clindamycin or macrolide if they're allergic. And if they have a prosthetic heart valve, previous endocarditis, or unrepaired cyanotic heart lesion like this patient, they're going to need this before any dental procedure. Next, we've got a six-year-old who's brought to the ED for worsening shortness of breath and chest pain. For the last few days, he was described as very fatigable with intermittent fevers. And two weeks ago, he had a URI that kept him home from school. On exam, there's decreased heart sounds and weak, irregular pulses. And this is a case of myocarditis. The next best step would be EKG. And you want to look for diffuse ST elevations for the pericarditis. You can order an ESR, CRP, and troponins. They're often increased. But the gold standard here is going to be a heart biopsy. And the treatment can be steroids or IVIG. It's common after some URIs or diarrheal illnesses. Looking at some pediatric chest x-rays, the first one here is going to be cardiomegaly. It's most likely due to a VSD. The next one we can show rib notching from a coarctation of the aorta and three sign within the ribs. Next we've got tetralogy of Fallot with the boot-shaped heart. And then we've got transposition of the great arteries with that widened mediastinum. Moving on to pulmonary. The learning objectives here are to categorize neonatal respiratory disease and their management, to determine the cause and treatment of pediatric strider, to analyze the etiologies of pediatric pneumonias, and manage the step-up treatment of asthma, and identify common pediatric pathologies on chest x-ray. So starting out with neonatal respiratory distress, we've got a case of a 22-year-old prime mom who presents to the emergency department at 31-week gestation with pelvic pain and rupture of membranes. She received sporadic prenatal care and admits to using cigarettes and cocaine while pregnant. Vital signs show a BP of 145 over 105 and a heart rate of 112, respiratory rate of 22. The infant delivers shortly thereafter and is visibly distressed with grunting, nasal flaring, and retractions. On exam, he's acrocyanotic and tachycardic with a heart rate of 167 and tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 72. He's slow to respond to stimulation. The next best step here would be a chest x-ray, and uh, neonatal respiratory distress is going to show fine granular opacities and air bronchograms. The causes here are underdevelopment of the lungs that lack mature sulfactant from type 2 pneumocytes, and the treatment would be continuous positive airway pressure ventilation with oxygenation. You can think intubation and mechanical ventilation and exogenous sulfactants for severe cases, and you can prevent this with glucocorticoid administration for premature mothers. Think anyone less than 34 weeks gestation, and you can predict the risk of neonatal respiratory distress with a lectin to sphingomyosin ratio of less than 2 to 1. Some other causes of respiratory distress, we've got a case of a 36-year-old G6P4115 mom who presents to the emergency department past her due date, and she's not gone into labor. The patient is induced with intravaginal prostaglandins and IV oxytocin. Subsequently, they performed an amniotomy, which yielded dark brown discoloration of fluid. So following delivery, the neonate's exam reveals a heart rate of 165, respiratory rate of 70, and oxygen sat of 87. The newborn appears to be in distress with retractions, grunting, and nasal flaring. Diagnosis here would be meconium aspiration syndrome. The next best step is oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal suctioning, and the chest x-ray might show a patchy infiltrate with coarse streaking in both lung fields and flattening diaphragm, and the treatment here would be monitoring and maintenance of the oxygen status. You can try a trial of steroids or PDE at one. Next we've got a newborn born to a G3 P0, P2002 mom. She's experiencing respiratory distress. Vital signs show the baby has cyanosis and hypotension and tachypnea. On exam, the newborn has a concave abdomen and barrel-shaped chest. Breath sounds are heard in the right chest and absent in the left, although there are bowel sounds heard within the chest. 
The diagnosis here would be a diaphragmatic hernia. The next best steps are airway stabilization and NG tube for bowel decompression. A follow-up chest x-ray can show bowel within the hemi chest. So there are the Bodchak hernia, which is the most common, and it's posterior lateral herniation, and the Morgogni hernia, which is rare, and it's a subxiphoid herniation. Complications include respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary hypoplasia, and pulmonary hypertension, and you want to treat this with intubation and ECMO followed by surgery. So now TTN and TEF. We've got a case of a 24-year-old G2 mom who presents with gestational diabetes not well controlled. She comes to labor and delivery for a scheduled C-section. The infant is persistently acrocyanotic, and on exam, birth weight is 4.7 kilograms. Heart rate is 155, respiration is 65, and saturating 92% on nasal cannula. The newborn appears to be in distress with retractions, grunting, and nasal flaring, and the lungs are clear to auscultation with no murmurs heard. The diagnosis here would be transient tachypnea of the newborn, or TTN. The next best steps are normal stimulation and oxygen. A chest x-ray might show bilateral perihilar streaking or fluid within the um, lines of the lungs. Risk factors here are being macrosomic, infants of diabetic mothers, or cesarean delivery. It's thought that you're not wringing out the fluid from the lungs during the delivery tract. And the treatment is supportive care with oxygenation or CPAP. It should usually resolve on day of life one or two. Next, we've got a baby without prenatal history, born via normal spontaneous vaginal delivery at 41 weeks. On exam, the baby is drooling excessively, has difficulty breathing. An NG tube is attempted to be placed, but the chest x-ray shows the tube coiled within the thorax. And this is a trachea esophageal fistula, TEF, and it's related to the other Vactor congenital associations. You can treat this with stabilization and PPI, and it's eventually going to need surgical correction. Now for the patient with Strider, we've got a four-year-old from Europe who presents with difficulty breathing. Vital signs show BP of 89 over 64, pulse of 124, and respiratory rate of 38, temperature of 38.7. On exam, he is tripoding with inspiratory strider and drooling, so this would be typical of epiglottitis. The next best step would be an endotracheal intubation in an OR, and this is in case a tracheostomy is needed. And a cricothyroidotomy is not supposed to be performed in less than 12 years due to the risk of subglottic stenosis following it. An x-ray might show a thumbprint sign with a loss of the vallecular space, and causes could be haemophilus influenza, staph, and strep. This can be prevented with the um, H. flu vaccine. Next, we've got a, a healthy three-year-old who presents with difficulty breathing and cough. His mother describes a barking cough with strider and hoarseness that worsens at night. There are no sick contacts at daycare or at home, and vital signs show a mild fever and tachypnea. On exam, he has coryza without drooling. So this would be more croup of or um, Lorengo tracheobronchitis. Next best step would be to keep calm and give O2. A chest x-ray could show a steeple sign, and you want to classify this with a Westley score. The treatment is oxygen supplementation as needed with steroids and nebulized um, epinephrine. Now we've got a two-year-old who develops sudden onset shortness of breath. His mother says that when he went to the kitchen just for a second, and when she returned, he appeared choking with difficulty breathing. On exam, there's strider and wheezing only on the right side. So this is a foreign body aspiration. The majority end up in the right main bronchus because of its anatomic position. And you can treat this with a rigid bronchoscope. It's diagnostic and therapeutic. Chest x-rays might show hyperinflation or atelectasis and possibly visualization of the foreign body, depending on what it is. Last, we've got a concerned parent bringing in a five-month-old with difficulty breathing. She describes strider that occurs when the baby is laying down, crying, or feeding. And over the past few weeks, she's developed emesis after feeds. And this can be laryngomalacia. The next best step would be a flexible laryngoscope to confirm it, showing collapse of the supraglottic structures and an omega-shaped epiglottitis and epiglottis. The treatment is an upright position after feeds and acid blockers, and you can reinsure the parents. In severe cases, there's poor weight gain, apnea, cyanosis, and supraglottoplasty is needed. So now moving into pneumonias, there's a case of a two-year-old boy presenting with a cough and fever. He's in a daycare program and has three siblings. Four weeks ago, his brother was treated for otitis media, and his vital signs show temperature of 38.5. On exam, there are ronchi and increased tactile fremitus in the right hemi chest. Diagnosis here would be a community-acquired pneumonia.
It's usually due to strep pneumonia or some atypical bugs. A chest x-ray might show a lobar pneumonia or an interstitial pneumonia. And the treatment is high dose amoxicillin. You can try a macrolide or amoxicillin clavulanic acid if he's treated with penicillin within a month. So next we've got an 18 year old who presents with coughing fits that result in emesis. Last week he had a mild cough with rhinorrhea and coryza. He has a normal birth history but has play dates with families of anti-vaxxers. Labs show leukocytosis with 80% lymphocytes and this is whooping cough. It, pre it begins with a catarrhal phase of one to two weeks where there's rhinorrhea followed by a, a paroxysmal phase of two to six weeks where there's coughing that results in post of emesis and it's the classic whoop and there's slow resolution following that. The treatment is macrolides and you want to prevent this with an acellular vaccine, the DTaP vaccine. Next we've got an eight week old male who's brought to the pediatrician due to a persistent cough. His mother noticed a short and dry cough and some nasal congestion. He's not immunized and he lives at home with no sick contacts, siblings, pets, or smoking. Birth history includes a home birth and his mother did not receive prenatal care. On exam, he has bilateral rails without wheezing in the lungs. And CBC shows eosinophilia. So this is similar to like an asthma case, but this is too young to present with asthma. And the diagnosis is chlamydial pneumonia. The next step would be a chest x-ray and it'll show hyperinflated lungs with bilateral interstitial infiltrates and you want to treat this with oral macrolides and macrolide eye drops. So this child could have presented with um, neonatal conjunctivitis from the chlamydia, uh, but up to 40% of patients don't present with the conjunctivitis and they present with chlamydia pneumonia. Next, we've got a six month old patient with clear rhinorrhea preceding a difficulty breathing and a cough. He was born at full term without longer cardiac abnormalities. And on exam, there's wheezing and crackles with tachypnea and nasal retractions and this is bronchiolitis. It's usually due to RSV, and it peaks five to seven days after the symptoms begin. It's very common in the winter months, and the treatment here is gonna be supportive care with hydration, bulb suctioning, and oxygenation. For any preterms less than 29 weeks, or if they have a history of lung or cardiac abnormalities, they can be treated with pavalizumab. Going into cystic fibrosis, we've got a case of a six-year-old Eastern European girl presenting with her third pneumonia in the past calendar year. She has a history of delayed passing in meconium and failure to thrive as an infant. She's currently at the fifth percentile for height and weight. And on exam, there's diffuse wheezing and ronchi in bilateral lungs. The next best step would be a sweat chloride. This is done universally now. And the definitive test is genetic, looking for autosomal recessive trait involving the sodium chloride transporter. The most common cause is Delta, 5, um, Delta F508. Some complications include meconium ileus, which we'll get into in the GI section, exocrine pancreatic disease, CF-related diabetes and malnutrition, um, which increases the work of breathing and pancreatic disease, and then infertility and osteopenia. The treatment would be chest physiotherapy, DNase, inhaled hypertonic saline, all to try and remove some of this excess mucus in the lungs and then pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy to help with digestion um, and nutrition, immunizations and lug transplant to prevent some of these infections, and then antibiotics against Pseudomonas MRSA and other multi-drug resistant organisms are eventually needed because of the constant colonization and infection. Next, we've got a case of asthma. So we have a five-year-old who presents to the physician for shortness of breath and chest tightness. She's also had a dry cough that's worse at night. She has a history of childhood eczema and food allergies. On exam, there's diffuse wheezing in all lung fields. And laboratory studies show eosinophilia. The next best step would be spirometry, and you can try this before and after bronchodilators, or you can induce a spasm with a methacholine test. And you can consider peak flow um, to help with treatment options. And during an exacerbation, you want to check a chest x-ray to look for any pneumonia or pneumothorax, and you need to monitor ABGs for CO2 normalization. That can be a sign of impending respiratory failure and the need to intubate. The treatment here is based on severity of their symptoms. So symptoms can be mild to severe and intermittent to persistent, and you step up therapy starting with a short-acting beta agonist, and then you can try an inhaled corticosteroid, followed by a long-acting beta agonist or leukotriene modifier, and then rarely chromalin, omelizumab, or theophylline are used. And then during exacerbations, you want to nebulize the short-acting beta agonist with corticosteroids and magnesium, and you need to watch closely for the need to intubate.
So going over some chest x-rays here, we've got a complete whiteout um, showing neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Next, there's a diaphragmatic hernia where there's bowel herniated within the left hemidiaphragm. And then here there's transient tachypnea of the newborn, so you can see fluids within the fissure lines of the lungs. And next is meconium aspiration syndrome where there's patchy infiltrate throughout. Next is epiglottitis with the steeple sign and croup. And then foreign, aspira or foreign body aspiration syndrome, uh, where you can see decreased lung markings on one side. And then chlamydial pneumonia with hyperinflations and interstitial lobar infiltrate. So that's it for the cardiac, pulmonary, and um, sort of immunodeficiencies chapter. Next up, we'll move through GI and some of the other organ systems for part two. I am Professor Patrick. Professor. Dr. Professor Patrick. <laughs>